Welcome to the Recovery Lab podcast. We're glad you were able to join us. Recovery Lab hopes to destigmatize addiction and normalize recovery. Our platform provides an avenue to share the many stories of those that have recovered from addiction, providing for the listener the most basic antidote to addiction. Hope. All right, everybody, we're back. Uh, Daniel and I forgot to do my uh, general introductory. Daniel reminds me what episode number this is. This is 83. 83. This is the 83rd episode of the Recovery Lab podcast series. My name is Drew Hassan. I'm Daniel Anderson. We are the Recovery Lab. We're coming to you from the Recovery Lab studios. That's right. And um, we we have we have an update today mm-hmm. uh, on our separate and respective journeys. Yes. So uh, we we don't have a guest today, but you, the listener, gets to benefit from from our uh, transparent and open and honest. Yeah, absolutely. And I was um, I was actually what was that Saturday? I was in therapy Saturday, and um, a therapist and, and I were chit chatting, and she mentioned that uh, some of her favorite episodes were when it was just you and I. So really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she specifically uh, mentioned the last episode with the Lomictal, uh conversations, and um, so yeah. Even if we don't have a guest, I think we're still doing some good. I, look, I completely agree. And it's good for us, and we get some good content, and we snip out. You snip out some good stuff, and we yeah. get to post it, and yeah. hopefully, maybe say something that will attract somebody. Yeah. Do you want to start with what's going on with you, or you want to start with the what do you want? Let's start with you. Okay. Uh, so I I often tease my kids on the the dangers of what I I, I say I call to the I call the, the wokies like these woke lunatics that are on TikTok. And right. I'm not on TikTok, but I get uh, the after effect. You know, when it when it filters its way down to YouTube, then I'll, you know. Which is approximately 3.7 months after right. they actually you, come you out. Said yeah. That. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll hear something and say it to you, and you're like, I knew about that. Yeah, Six last months. year. <laughs> you might as well tie roll your blue jeans. <laughs> so anyway... Uh, the Wokies, and there are for sure some some lunatics out there that hold, uh, you know, woke beliefs, and I I know that they those those fringe belief holders don't represent the community at large, but uh, it seems the the Democratic Party has latched on to. Uh, some of these more fringe elements. Yeah, and, and it's it's worth noting that here at the Recovery Lab podcast, we're not Republican, we're not Democrat, we're not we're just here to help with people trying to get rid of yeah, these yeah. things. So I, I know you may be listening to uh, and wondering how does this possibly relate to recovery. So this this just blew my mind. I do not watch this show, but it's a host- it's in a hospital setting. I don't really know anything about it, but it's called New Amsterdam. Yeah. Okay. So I'm flipping through Twitter the other night, and this video pops up, and it, there's a scene where and I've gone back and watched uh, longer snippets of the episode, but I haven't seen the whole episode. But I think that I can faithfully – relay to the audience and to you what was in this collection of scenes. So there's a little boy who appears to be Hispanic and he has a stomach tumor of, of unidentified origin. And the, the, the show seems to be centered around how did this boy get this tumor now in real life, like how that would compare to actual medical practice. I have no idea, you know, how it got there while important, would seem to be to, to take a back seat to what are we going to do to fix it. Right. But anyway, for the show, the little boy has a tumor, and the doctor wants to find out how it got there. So the doctor meets with the young boy, and he asks him all these questions. 
you know, what do you, what do you do? Blah, blah, blah. What do you do for fun? And the little boy makes some comments about school and stressors. And the doctor said, you know, you can see like the light bulb goes off in the doctor. The doctor's like, I want to, let me ask you something else. And he whoops out this book and he's going through this series of questions uh, like, and I don't remember them off the top of my head, but do you feel important? And the little boy was like, absolutely not. And do you think your voice matters? Absolutely not. Do you think your teacher likes you? Absolutely not. Uh, and so we pivot a few scenes later and the doctor is meeting with the little boy's mother and the mother's like, you know, what did you find out? What, you know, what have you learned? And the doctor says, you know, with this look on his face, like I've had some true insight here and I figured it out. And the doctor tells her, look, I, I deployed this test and it's real. I did Google it. It's called unrest, which I assume is an acronym for something. <clears throat> I don't know that much about it developed by some scientists at Harvard and it, it is intended to detect the level of social opposition is what they call it. And that is a minority groups, uh, how much opposition they have to the dominant, the, the dominant, uh, the majority holders. So I guess if you were black, this would be your resistance to being white. That's the, that's the general idea All right. in white values, whatever those are. So the scene continues and the doctor says, look, your boy, although he doesn't know what this word means, feels disenfranchised, marginalized. And the mother's like, but this is impossible. I worked really hard to get him in this progressive school and he only, he has great friends and he only has, uh, he only, uh, goes out for sports where the coaches are diverse. And the doctor says, look, the only thing I can tell you is that he feels this way, but because he lives in a world where he's not supposed to feel that way, he internalizes this, these feelings, the internalizing these feelings of racism has led to an increase in his production of cortisol, the stress hormone, dot, dot, dot. His tumor was caused by racism. And I thought this has got to be the craziest shit this, like this is up there with some of the craziest stuff I've ever heard. And I started thinking about like, why is this so alarming? And I'll tell you. So viewed through the lens of what has been beneficial to me personally in recovery and what I know to be beneficial to others is, is the single most important thing is to take responsibility for your own actions that you got yourself here not finding fault and blame with other people. And the underlying philosophical belief that if something is wrong with me, I need to look at all these external factors and forces first is a recipe for disaster. If you cannot seem to take responsibility for your own actions or your, your own life, then you will forever be looking for someone else to blame. And you're, if that's the only thing that you're looking for, you will never run out of other people to blame. Mm -hmm. You, you will run out of being alive if you're on drugs. Cause you're, you're either going to drink yourself to death and have a car accident and kill yourself, uh, or you're going to OD. So you're going to run out of opportunities but you will never run out of things that you don't like. You will never run out of society makes me feel a certain way. You will never run out of my wife won't do right. And so our marriage is failing. It must be her fault. You're never going to run out of things to blame your kids for. Like if all you know to do is to find fault with external forces, then you've got an infinite number of things to be upset about. Why? Because people will always do what you don't want them to do. People will always treat you ways that you don't really wish to be treated. People are going to say things to you that you wish they hadn't said. So, the, you know, your boss never appreciates you enough. Your wife never listens to you enough. Your kids, you know, talk back all the time. The, your, you know, the battery died in your car on your way to work that morning. There's always going to be 
a level of dissatisfaction with the stimuli you get from the world at large. And I don't understand why this isn't more prevalent than it is. I mean, I know that the cheap shot is to say, oh, you know, these Wokies, they'll tell you that you can wake up and you can just decide, oh, men are women or women are men. I mean, that's kind of the low-hanging fruit criticism. The The real criticism is this sense of entitlement that underlie, underlies it all. This sense of it, if something is wrong with me, it can't be my fault. Yeah. It can't be my responsibility. Uh, you know, I, I have found so – I have thought that this was the craziest – like, I don't even know. I'm, how did that actor read that line and think, oh, this is good. This, this is good. This is some good shit here. I bet I get an award for this. Like, it's, it's crazy. And I, I don't understand why people are so dead set on, on refusing to take personal responsibility. So I felt like that for a little while, and then I thought, how long did you live not taking responsibility for any of your behaviors, for always blaming other people? Well, I wouldn't do this. If, I mean, look, if, I, if, you, if this had been done to you. If you had my life. If you, you know. <laughs> and until somebody told me or until I was put in a position to where it was either accept that you really are at the center of all your problems, you won't ever, you won't ever improve. Yeah. I, I, uh, I was kind of getting worked up as you were talking about like, how dare them, you know, but then, you know, to, to say that a, a tumor is caused by racism, I mean, might be a bit of a stretch, but I get what Hollywood's trying to do and they're, they're doing it pretty aggressively. But, for me, you know, I think it's important to touch on the responsibility responsibility that I've learned since I've been sober this time, which you know was three years, April eleventh. Um, that when I was in active addiction, from the age of nine years old to thirty, what, uh, thirty six, thirty five, thirty six. Uh, literally everything was someone else's fault and it there was a deep there was a deep ingrained feeling or thought that i am the way that i am because i was adopted and like i would kind of go back and forth i'd go to therapy and then that that thought process would kind of be dulled down a little bit and then i would come back to it and then you know i would inevitably get back on drugs and and that was that that was the common denominator throughout throughout my whole life was well my own mom didn't love me enough uh to keep me so how could anyone love me so i was constantly and, and very aggressively searching out ways to be able to place the blame on someone else because for me and i can't speak for anyone else but for me taking responsibility and taking the blame or 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 accepting that every issue that I have in my life right now is a direct result of a poor life decision that I've made in my life. And I wasn't able to really understand that or, or get to that position until I got sober and got those, got the dope out of my system. Um, and my stance on it today, where I'm at today is, uh, you know, with the exception of like home life and, things that are really, really close to me. And it's, you know, they, I, I still, I'm certainly a work in progress and I'm, I can be pretty quick to point the finger at, you know, people that are closest to me, really just one person um, that's, that's close to me because I, I know her better than anyone else in this world. She knows me better than anyone else in this world. So I, I can be left to my own devices. I can be very, very quick to, well, if she wouldn't have done this, then I wouldn't have done this. And, but today I do have this tool in my tool belt. That's like, well, why don't we take a second, take a step back from what we're thinking right now 
and really, really dive into what the root of this resentment is or what the root of this fear is. And 100% of the time, that's 10 out of 10 times, I play a role in whatever this fear or resentment is. So, and, and then I've had a lot of therapy and, and been open to hearing difficult things from my therapist, like things that are not, you know, that are contrary to what I want to hear. Like, hey, you are being really selfish in this, in this area. Uh, so I think my, my experience with the therapy and talking with other people and just a, a, a general over, just a kind of a, a generalized desire to be better and to, to, to be the, the best person that I can be. And what goes along with that is the willingness to change for me. I got to be willing to change. If I'm willing to change, then there's hope for me. And I can begin to think not from the, this is, this is their fault. This is their fault, but okay. How do I play a role in this part and in, in, in what's going on right now? And I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, I have no control over anyone or anything other than me. I have, I have control over me. I don't have control over anyone else. So my first thought is, okay, let's give this, this person a little bit of grace Let's dive into what the issue is. Why am I pissed off about this and, and what's my role in it? And then what's the solution? How can I, how can I best serve myself and, and the person that I'm, I'm struggling with? And, and today I, I, it's, I'm, I'm very quick to, uh, you know, more so with people that are not in my inner circle, but certainly those people as well, but to, to be quick to forgive and, uh, be quick to be like, Hey, you know what? I've also had bad days. Maybe this person's just having a bad day and, and kind of go on with my day. But I, I am, I'm pretty good at not pointing the fingers at people today just because I have a little bit of experience with what it's like to live in sobriety and to have, you know, this, this toolkit that like, Hey, if there's something going on with me, if, if something about you pisses me off, there's probably something wrong with me. And just being willing to look at that and have that conversation with myself and, and to realize that, hey, you know, we're all imperfect. We're all humans. We're doing the best we can. Um, there's one exception. Lord, help me to not lose my cool right now. There is a certain demographic, of, not necessarily a demographic, that's not the right term, but there are a certain group of people who when I experience them, I have the most passionate hatred and disdain for to the point where I wish that they were not on this planet. And those people are people that drive below the speed limit in the left-hand lane. With the, and, and this is a problem for me. This is a problem for me. For those people... For those of you that drive in the left lane slower than the speed limit, please, please just move over. Just, just move over. It, it's like a five-foot move. What if they drove in the left lane slower than the speed limit and grunted real loud at the gym? <laughs> Uh, we got real problems. We got real problems. And I'd love to say that the, and we'll touch on this in a bit, that the, the, the little, uh, Lamictal journey has helped with this, but still a work in progress with this. Um, but yeah, I think it's important to not point fingers and also to, to be kind with people that are where you were at, where I was at for all of those years that were in active addiction, in and out of addiction, whatever the case may be, but you were actively searching for other people to blame, whether you were sober or not, that was something that we did. So, you know, and, and we've only been, you've been sober how many years? Five, six years, seven years? How long has it been? Bear with us here. We're counting on our fingers. This right going to be seven. Seven years. All right. And I've only got three years. So that means I'm better than you. <laughs> <laughs> so 
All of the years, you're, you're how old? 72, 73? I'll 70. be 40. I will be 48. 48. Okay. And I'm almost 40. So for all of those years, we were assholes and constantly blaming other people. And now, just in the most recent of years. Just assholes. We're just <laughs> assholes. <laughs> So who are we to look down at other people that are doing the exact same thing that we did for 30 plus years, you know? So if we keep that in perspective, like, Hey, you know, this guy's having a bad day. Yeah. Okay. Or, or he's, you know, he's actively a piece of shit and, and pointing the finger at everyone and not taking any responsibility for anything that's happened in his life. Guess what? We did that for 30 plus years. So, but I still, I, I still hate people that drive in the left lane too slow. She would just get off the road, please. Back to you, Drew. Well, that, that was really it. Uh, it's uh, it, it's really an interesting, like the the collection of scenes that are cobbled together on YouTube. It's like nine minutes long, and it's really pretty interesting. But it it's got to be the most anti scientific assertion of all time. You know, there are other factors about the little boy who, who's got the tumor that I'm not, I, I didn't mention. Uh, you know, so we, we know that he goes to a progressive school and he has what I assume are black, white and Hispanic coaches. Those are really the, the factors that the mom lays out as to what is in his life that would insulate him from the things that quote unquote, she had to go through when she was younger. And like, how do you measure that? Uh, you know, the doctor, when he's talking to the little boy says, listen, you know, even people like me, uh, uh sometimes perpetuate, uh, the racist ideals of this country and don't even realize we're doing it. And I mean, part, part of me as a lawyer is like, I don't think y'all realize, uh, how fantastic the legal system really is here. Uh, th that any person, if they feel aggrieved, may take any other person to court, Ir irrespective of financial abilities. You know, there's not like a poll tax for filing a complaint. And if if Trump can be indicted, tried, and convicted. Uh, I think that stands for the, the proposition that, you know, the law treats all people equally. Right. Um, you know, sure, there may be individual cases where somebody got a benefit that some other people didn't get. But on, on the whole, everybody has the same access to the court system. And like it or not, you know, the we... We, if you feel aggrieved by something I've done, then we uh, turn that into a dollar amount that would that would punish the wrongdoer, and they have to pay you. I mean, you know, if somebody hurts my feelings, I can't have them lashed in the the town square, but I I can have them pay a money judgment, right, and. You know, are there people that are racist? Of course. But the fabric of this country is not racist. I don't believe capitalism is racist. I believe capitalism is, I mean, there, there are criticisms of it, but I think it's better than communism or socialism. I would agree. We're getting a little far afield here. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, the, the alarming lack of personal responsibility uh, in in younger generations, I think, is going to is, is going to be problematic for them, and it's going to be problematic for a number of reasons. But for Recovery Labs' concern, it's certainly going to be problematic for them when they grow up and they have some sort of addiction. Yeah, because <clears throat> if you're taught and treated your whole life that there are invisible forces at work against you, and they're truly to blame for all of your life's woes, then you're, you will never, ever be able to get, we'll call it sober, but 
you'll never be able to get off of whatever your addiction is. Right. Gambling, sex, food. Oh, well, I, the, I, the school system is racist and I had to eat these, this case of Snickers. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, the world is an imperfect place and there will be racist people until the end of time, but, people are going to be people. I don't really, I mean, it's just, it's, I don't, I don't know. I just, I, I try to not allow that kind of negative bullshit into my world. Um, I try at least. I mean, I'm not an evolutionary biologist or anything and I, I'm not, I haven't studied this so much, but it, uh, affinity is, is a, almost has a, evolutionary function people tend to like people like themselves more than they like other people yeah uh you know uh japanese people are are exceptionally rejecting of non-japanese people yeah uh of of the the asian cultures they're the most like if you're not Japanese, you're you're garbage. <laughs> um, and black people tend to like black people more than other people, and white people tend to like white people more than other people. Yeah. And trying to criminalize or make immoral this very natural fact, and it, it doesn't even have to be racist. I mean, it could be. If I got to pick, if I had to be around people and I, and I'm forced to either be around, say someone from some other culture that I don't understand that eats food that I don't like, that lives ways I don't like, I'm, I'm, I mean, you're going to pick to be around people from Mississippi. Like these are, these are my people. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, I think that there is some good that can come from trying to tamp down tribalism, but anyway, let's stick with uh, racism does not cause tumors. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's fair to, that's that's, that's a fair conclusion to come with this. I I, I want to switch gears for just a second. Uh, let's switch before we get into the Lamictal debacle. Well, it's not really a debacle. I was watching the TikTok, which for those of you that are not familiar, TikTok is where the most recent trends and videos and dances and funny clips and uplifting spiritual content is um, is displayed while people like Drew, who are not fans of TikTok, will get the exact same content a matter of 3.7 months after it comes out on TikTok. So I was watching TikTok now that we're all on the same page. And there was a gentleman who has actually been in this studio before uh, as, uh, as a guest on the Black Sheep Recovery Warfare podcast, which is a faith-based recovery podcast. And he posted a video this morning talking about, uh, I know I'm going to get some backlash from this, but... Uh, the question was that he was responding to is, what are your thoughts on AA and NA? And he went on a, this big old spiel. And he said, I can't stand AA and NA. When you receive Jesus Christ in your life, the addiction is removed from you entirely, and you are never, ever under the bondage of drugs and alcohol again. So why would I want to go into an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting or a Narcotics Anonymous meeting and have to say that I'm so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic or I'm so-and-so and I'm an addict? Once you are relieved of the bondage of drugs and alcohol from Jesus Christ, you are no longer an addict. You are no longer an uh, al uh, alcoholic and you are saved by the redemption of Jesus Christ. And there was a massive amount of engagement on this. People chiming in. Yeah, praise God, praise God. Jesus worked for me. I, I was saved. Yeah, I did AA for, for a year and then I haven't been back and, and life is great. I'm wonderful. And here I am thinking to myself, what kind of person who gives a shit about someone else 
would get on a TikTok platform. This guy has like over 100,000 followers and say that I can't stand. We're not even going to say A or NA. What he's saying is I can't stand any path other than the path that I took in order to get sober. I can't stand someone that does smart recovery because it's different from me. I can't stand someone that went through NA and got sober because they were ready to get sober when they were in fucking NA. I can't stand someone who who finally has tried the God path over and over and over again and smashed their head against the wall and finally they're ready. They've had enough pain. They walk into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and something clicks. They are finally attached to a fellowship of people that are like-minded to, to them where they don't experience any sort of judgment or very little judgment or, or, or any sort of negativity towards the path that they've taken. Who is this person, Blake Spitz Fire, to talk down to anyone who has a different path to recovery than, than they do? Me personally? If God only works for you, fucking right. Glad for you. I'm happy for you. If you have a, 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 a good, positive life as a result of work going through Celebrate Recovery or, or you know, just like getting on your hands and knees and, and praying to God and, and being at the point where you are done fighting. You're done fighting. This is what's directly in front of you. You get on your knees. You pray to God. God, I am done. Please help me. And you experience long-term sobriety as a result of that. I love that for you. I love that for you. For me, I did that for 19 years. I searched in God only for 19 years. I went to, I led small groups at Pine Lake Church. I tried every avenue. With the God only. I tried Celebrate Recovery. I tried every possible way to get sober. And it took me 19 years before I finally got to a point where I was so devastated that I had a little bit of experience with AA. And I was like, you know what? I'm either going to kill myself or I'm going to give something else a shot. I'm going to give this one more shot. And what that one thing was, it just so happened to be Alcoholics Anonymous. So... I was at the point where I was at the end of my rope and the first thing that was in front of me was Alcoholics Anonymous. I walk into Alcoholics Anonymous with the tail be with my tail between my legs and what do I experience? Man, we're gra we're, we're super glad you're back. The only thing that I heard that that me that first meeting back after I shared, actually I don't think I shared that first meeting. The the first couple times that I went back, I, I may have shared like the third time that I was back. And all I heard was we love you. Keep coming back. Now, I guarantee you, if I went into my small group that I was leading in between periods of sobriety at Pine Lake and said, hey, guys, you know what? I'm struggling with my sex addiction. I'm struggling with being on and off meth. Uh, I'm struggling with wanting to do cocaine. I also want to have multiple affairs with multiple people. I don't love myself, and I certainly can't love the person that I'm with right now. Uh, I just want to be open and honest with you guys. Their jaws would have dropped. And they said, well, we'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. And that would have done absolutely fucking nothing for me. Because I wasn't ready. So I am, if you, if you can tell, this video got me worked up a little bit. Just maybe just a little bit. So I turn the question over to you. And, and, and my official stance as a member of the Recovery Lab podcast is there are approximately 1.76 billion, that's with a B, billion different paths to long-term sobriety. If a path that you have chosen works for you, whether it be faith-based, uh, God-only, Celebrate Recovery, N-A, A-A, C-A, O-A, G-A, uh, smart recovery, uh, whatever. If that works for you from the bottom of my heart, I fucking love that for you. And I wish you nothing but the best. But if someone comes up here and talks shit 
about now, any of those ways. Well, how was that? Re- I'm sure. I mean, that, he was speaking to the choir, though. I mean, the the he was on a faith based. Yeah, this was okay. a this was a TikTok that he created. He was a guest on a faith based recovery podcast that I produced. Oh, okay, he when he said that. No, when he said that was yesterday. I guess he created. He was on the podcast. He was. Uh, oh, he there, didn't. He didn't say that. Also here. And no. Then on, on the okay. No, no, no. He he said that 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 came out today. And he's also like super anti gay. Like super. If you're gay, like God hates you, and you're going to hell. Period. End of story. Which, you know what. I also don't necessarily agree with that. You know, I think I I I don't have an official position on that because I'm not those people that think they're gay. So who? How can I possibly say that they're lying when they say the first thoughts that they had as as far as being an adult or or growing up as a child was, hey, I like guys or I like the same sex. I like women. Who am I to say that they're lying? You know, I can't say that. So for him to get up on this high horse and say, if you're gay, you're going to hell. I mean, you're certainly entitled to your to your opinion. But what are your thoughts specifically, the, the gay part aside, what are your thoughts specifically on someone getting on a public platform, speaking to hundreds of thousands of people and saying that Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous is stupid and you should never go, and I quote, you should never go to an NA or AA meeting ever. You, my first response is you wouldn't have to look around this town or this area very long to find a lot of people that completely agree with him. Yeah. Uh, you know, you generally don't find AA meetings in Presbyterian churches uh, because of the of their adherence to the idea that Jesus can fix everything. Yeah. So the... This is one of the fundamental flaws in in that belief in in believing that Jesus will fix everything. So, uh, you know, like I went to the City of Refuge, a faith based treatment center that absolutely uh, believes that that AA and NA are crutches. And yeah, that's any, one of the things he said. Too. Anything that destroy anything that keeps you from having an intense one on one relationship with Jesus is bad. So uh, it, it's, it's alarming how many people think that way when, when in reality, I think that you know, when you're in recovery, you often hear how, well, God brought me to AA and AA brought me to God. Right. I mean, AA is more commonly a conduit or NA is more commonly a conduit for people to develop a relationship with God than it is an obstacle to it. Right. Uh, but those people, uh, that that's the same kind of virtue signaling that the Wokies do. And, you know, having, uh, you know, that the crazy colored hair, if you're a white person, like yeah. you're, you're advertising that you align with those <laughs> kinds of beliefs. <laughs> so that, that's the kind of virtue signaling that they do. Uh, and you know they they are fortified in their beliefs by the language of their holy book, the Bible. Uh, you know, no one comes. To, you can't get to God unless it's through Jesus. No one comes to me except through my whatever. I can't quote it. Right. So you know they. That's one of the dividing factors of. You know if 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 you have a holy book, then. The holy book can be used to divide more than than anything. Uh, the Quran does it. The Bible does it. I I can't I can't speak about the Bhagavad Gita or some other holy books, but I mean none of them say this is the right way, or it might be wrong. Maybe somebody else's is better. I mean, they, none of them say that they all, I mean, they, they got to be holy books because they say, this is how you, this is how you conduct your affairs and how you will be benefited thereby. And so, I mean, the Bible does it too. Yeah. And those kind of adherence to the, the strict letter of it, you know, promote that kind of belief. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's worth noting that, There is literally a line in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I am a very proud member of and not ashamed of at all. It says, very simply, be quick to see where religious people are right. 
Yes. That's our stance. Like, be quick to see where religious people are right. There's nowhere in the book that says people that believe in God are bad or people that only that that don't get sober with Alcoholics Anonymous that you're never going to you know what I mean? Like yeah. there's none of that. It's it, no no no. It, it's be it, quick to see where those people are right. There are just different takes on it. Like uh who who is the uh, Osteen? So Joel Osteen gets a lot of heat for never preaching about if you do X, you will go to hell. Yeah. And so I've seen interviews where he's confronted on this and he's like, look, it's just my, you know, and I, I think that Osteen probably has committed himself to being the, the cheerleader side of, of attracting people to God. You know, I'm, I'm going to be here and I'm going to spout off hope and goodness and, you know, prosperity. Co- pro- uh, yeah. Uh, and I think he leaves the hellfire and brimstone part of it to other people, you know, so, because for every Osteen there, there are, there's a guy out there saying, if you do this, you're going to rot in hell for all eternity. Yeah. And so Herman Fountain, the head of the city of refuge is of the latter. He is quick to tell you you're going to hell. Yeah. And all of the people in his in his sphere are, well, if you do this, you're going to hell. Yeah. Uh, and they all believe that, you know, if you say a few special words that all of your life's problems have evaporated, you know, this idea that I can, if I, all I've got to do is love Jesus and my addiction is going to be dissolved into thin, that's crazy talk. I mean, did it happen? Is there some person out there? that had a crippling addiction that confessed some allegiance to Jesus and they got off drugs and didn't do drugs again. I, I bet that's happened a few times, but more often than not, that did not happen. Yeah. They, uh, you know, they were on drugs. They said, Jesus, I love you. Help me out. And they did okay for a little while. And then they, they, their wife didn't have dinner hot when they got home and they whooped her ass and then, <laughs> and, and, and then got drunk. That, that happens more often. Uh, if we're gonna... <laughs> he told her. <laughs> told her twice. I, it better be hot. Uh, so it, it, it is crazy. Um, it, the, the city of refuge did not like 12 step meetings and we could not go to 12 step meetings and we couldn't have 12 step literature. Now, the Kimberly, where she went to treatment, the um, not Wings of Life, uh, Home of Grace, they could. So they had Jesus and 12 Steps. They had people that came and had 12 step meetings there, and they really got down with it. Another thing your guy might be suffering from is just a lack of, of understanding and knowledge. Uh, because if you look at the principles of the 12 steps and you aligned your life in keeping and did not offend some value of AA, you would lead a very decent Christian life. Mm -hmm. You would be a very decent, decent Christian person, you know, uh, apologize when you mess up, take responsibility for your actions, resolve to do better, give an earnest uh, earnest effort at doing better, uh, confess your wrongdoings, acknowledge your role in them, and then help someone else. I mean, if Jesus came down here, surely he would say, Hey, that's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, y'all, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and another thing, and I've talked about this in meetings before, but there, there are countless countless people that come into Alcoholics Anonymous that have no hope left. And they maybe perhaps grew up with Jesus. Their parents made them go to church three times a week and, um, or they just didn't have any experience with, with God or religion throughout their entire life. And those people are out on the street and, um, and, and say maybe this person has a, a resentment towards God. You know, they, God took my mom. God took my brother. God took my yeah. son. Hence the the need for the Osteens of the world. Right, right. I'm I'm not going to be the shame guy. Right. I'm going to be the hey, I love you. We'll figure it out. Right. Guy. 
But those those people who have an adverse feeling towards God in any way, shape, or form, there is no way in this world that they are going to be able to to have some guy that's that comes and comes from the corner and says, "Hey, we're from church. We're going to pray over you." And you can get sober if you just believe in God. There's no way in hell that guy is ever going to get sober. Ever. Ever. But that same guy has some guy that maybe has three months sober, six months sober, and he walks down to a group, goes and and serves lunch at a homeless shelter, gets to talking with this guy, George. George says, man, I'm at the the end of my rope. I, I don't. I've I've heard I've tried this God thing. I don't like God, and this guy from AA comes and says, "Hey, that's that's cool. I was the same way. I didn't believe in God when I I didn't believe in God, and I I kind of hated God, and I was kind of like all over the place. And you know, I was at the end of my rope, and and I went and I tried Alcoholics Anonymous because it was the la- literally the last thing that I could try, and I found out that hey, I." I can get sober. I got a sponsor. I started working the steps and and I got sober. My life is actually really, really good. And you don't have to, you don't have to know God. You don't have to believe in God. One of the very, in order to get sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, absolutely. you do in order to get saved by Jesus and get your addiction removed by God. You have to believe in God. If you want to get sober with God, you don't have to believe in a single fucking thing to get sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And not only that, but Alcoholics Anonymous is going to teach you how to find a power greater than yourself. No, you don't have to find God as your higher power. It can be a fucking doorknob. You can find a doorknob that you believe is is more powerful than you or a group of people that's more powerful than you. You can find that and you can get long-term sobriety. But if you want to go the same route that a lot of us go in Alcoholics Anonymous, we came in, we didn't really, we, we weren't fond of God. And we, we learned as a result of working the steps that, hey, we do see God as our higher power and we do pray to God and, and God is a massive part of our life. But we weren't there and we would have never gotten sober if this guy from church said, hey, Come on over here. Let me pray and let me lay my hand on you. Lord Jesus is going to save your life and going to save your addiction right now. Praise Jesus. That guy would have been like, go fuck yourself. I don't want anything you have. I can't relate to anything you have, but that same guy can go over to Alcoholics Anonymous, hear, t- hear someone talking about how, hey, my life was broken. I didn't believe a single fucking thing. Everything was wrong. I got in here. I, st- I did the small things that you guys recommended I do, and now I've been sober for 36 years, and I'll never look back. Hence the divine inspiration and genius behind the only requirement for membership is the desire desire to to stop stop drinking. drinking. Look, I said this in one of the very, or I think in maybe the first or second podcast, the, the true fool's errand is to not give AA a shot because you get wigged out about the God thing. Mm -hmm. Like just, the, the, only you are picking this fight. And I'm talking to 20 year ago, Drew, when yeah. I say this. Like, I would have saved myself a lot of headache and heartburn and discomfort if I had just said, yeah, okay, all right, whatever, with the God thing. Let's get on with it. Yeah. Because it's not, we're not here to, to endorse any any belief system no no we're absolutely not and i i don't i'm not endorsing alcoholics anonymous what i'm saying is alcoholics anonymous was the thing that worked for me well i'll endorse it to the extent that it's the thing that worked for me but i do agree with you that there are there are many paths to recovery yeah if if we sit down and say okay what what does recovery look like to you i mean it, it's it's a collection of of behaviors. Am I on drugs or alcohol? No. Okay. Check. Check. Am I being a better person? Check. Am I finding meaning in my life? Check. Am I uh, a functioning member of society? Do I find, you know, family life good, home life good? Am I operating to be a net good in the world? Check, check, check. Okay. I mean, however you got there, I'm, I'm, I'm here to supply, to supply. I'm here to support it. hundred percent. hundred percent. hundred percent. So my apologies for kind of going off on a, 
little tangent there, but man, that just. Mm. Do you think it 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 triggered some something in you from your from your past, like made you feel shame or? Uh, no. What he's doing is he is actively reducing the chance of someone that listens to his that follows him actually getting long term sobriety. He is stealing that from them. He is them. becoming the person that people run away from. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. So, no, there's not... I mean, I am... I am very pleased with my life. There was a lot of bad stuff that happened. There was a lot of bad stuff that I did that caused negative consequences for me. Let's say that. Right. I had wonderful parents. I had wonderful family. Like, like, you know, there was a... Uh, Jeff Foxworthy did a joke one time. He said, well, you know... One of these times, you know, I, I wish someone would just be honest, you know, when they go on to Oprah's show, you know, they say, you know, my mom was good. My dad was good. Everything in my life was good. I'm just a piece of shit. And he said, right. I just wish one time someone would go on there take and take a little bit of responsibility. And so for me, it's, it's, you know, don't go out there and spread hatred towards AA or NA. And if you're in AA or NA, although I've never experienced this, I've never experienced anyone in AA and NA saying to someone that got sober with, with faith only or celebrate recovery, oh, no, that's the stupidest thing you could ever do. Don't ever do that. I've never heard that. But I've heard it time and time again from people, religious people, saying, "Don't listen to, to don't listen to twelve step. They'll take you away from God." So that's the, let, let's be honest here. Let's be honest about the reality of the situation. You guys are sitting here saying that what we're doing is awful, and what we're doing over here is saying, "If that's your path, we love that for you." There's a disconnect here. So we're gonna move on. We're at fifty two minutes. So we're gonna do a quick quick update on my. Lamictal journey. Let's hear it. So I started off slow. Started off with uh, 25 milligrams once a day. Um, slowly built up to uh, now I'm at, I mean, I'm just going balls to the wall with vulnerability and openness and transparency. I don't give a shit. Uh, now I'm at 50 milligrams in the morning, 50 milligrams at night. And I kid you not, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's the placebo effect. But um, again, with the exception of my uh, fuel hatred while I'm driving, with exclusively with people that are driving in the left lane too small, uh, too slow with the exception of that, um, the overthinking, the, uh, fears of being duped or, or taken advantage of the, the, the fears of, um, you know, not being perfect or not doing something perfect. Much of that has been greatly diminished. And when I lay down at night, excuse me, I am able to, my, my brain is not racing a thousand minutes, a, a thousand miles an hour with thoughts and thoughts and thoughts. And like, how long have you been on it now? About a month. About a month. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to sit here and say that Lamictal is, all I'm doing is sharing my personal experience with this medication. It's not a cure-all, but no. it's taken a little bit of the pressure off to. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it is, it's certainly helped me. Um, and again, medications react with different people, different ways. So don't say that I'm up here, you know, now if Daniel told me to take it. Now, if Lamictal wants to sponsor the recovery lab, um, my number is 601-672-6591. Um, no, but all joking aside, it's worked well for me. I, I seem to be experiencing some positive, uh, co positive benefits from it. So I'm going to continue to, to give it a shot and see. Awesome. See I'm how happy to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, we're at 54 minutes. You got anything else that you'd like to no, drop down as a little it. knowledge? No? Nope. I've given all the knowledge I have. All right, wonderful. Well, again, this is Daniel Anderson and Drew Hassan with the Recovery Lab Podcast. You have just completed the 83rd. We have 83rd. just completed the 83rd episode of the Recovery Lab Podcast. I'm grateful to be here, and I'm grateful for all of you that have joined the live and will listen to this on your favorite podcast platform. Until next week, ladies and gentlemen. We will see you. We're out.